what is your opinion of the quote unquote leadership that we have within the United States among black community? Yeah, so I would say that the um, our leadership or our misleadership is a uh, very much white identified with a veneer of black culture um, to sort of hide that identity. Um, they sort of play a, a an apologetic uh, position for our institutions, uh, and they do that because they they're the ones that you know they made it. They're the good ones. They're the ones that did the right thing, and so they have this this um, unhealthy faith in these institutions without really um, recognizing that these institutions continually hurt the masses of, uh, you know, of our people. So that, that's, that's how I initially, you know, my initial feelings on uh, our leadership. Mm. What about mm -hmm. you, Sab? What about the Black mission leadership that, uh, in your opinion? I feel the same way too. I mean, I also feel like um, a lot of these individuals, some of the ones that you might see on the thumbnail, a lot of them are what we will refer to as the black boule, mm -hmm. right? A lot of them come from that particular group, meaning that like, these are the people that they rubbed the right shoulders and, and elbows to get to where they are. Some of them came from like Greek organizations, like fraternal Greek organizations, and they kind of moved up, you know, in the ranks and stuff there. And if you look at a lot of the, the black politicians that we have in this country, that's exactly where they came from. So some people refer to them as being part of like the black boule, and that's how they get to where they're where they are. So like you don't become vice president. So Kamala Harris, you don't become vice president just because you did a good job. You don't become senator just because you were a good lawyer and you campaigned well. These people rub, you know, elbows with the right people at the right time to get those spots. So working hard isn't enough to gain you that spot. Mm. Thank you very much for that. And in fact, I loved how you segue into that because that is actually something that I wanted to actually uh, go into into one of Katie's articles. This one is titled Black Political Power, the Devaluation. Uh, the, I'm sorry, the Devolution of Black Political Leadership. And then one of the things that you actually talk about is the Black Boule. Uh, this paragraph says the FIFO civil rights existed since the fall of the Reconstruction era. However, the actual movement commemorated every February contained prominent leaders who were members of the Black Boule, such as the invoked leader, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So this goes to show that, and from what I can see, is that there is a set of us who, it's nothing, not necessarily wrong that you're in, say, the Black Boule. It's what you do with it with when you're in it that I observe. And so that's kind of, you know, where I fall as well. And um, I was Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, like Marcus from the Political Matrix, him and Chris have talked about this often about the Black Boule, and it's it's really true, you guys. Like, I'm sorry. Like, I wish I could sit here and say that if you work hard, then success will follow. No, it's not just about working hard. Because if that were the case, everyone who works hard and a lot of people in this country do, they would have that same level of of success. It's about networking. It's about knowing the right people uh, at the right time, being in the right place at the right time, and also being a part of the status quo. This is why, if you notice, like no real like black radicals actually make it to those spots. They don't make it to a v VP spot. They don't become president of the United States like Barack Obama did. Uh, they're very much a part of the status quo, and they're very much there to keep the, basically keep things the way that they are, not to really improve it. Yeah, Cam, if you can uh, also reflect on what uh, Sabi just said, especially in regards to the connections portion, especially among colleges. Yeah, so um, I've been I've been reading uh, one of um, uh, Fraser's uh, books called the the Black Bourgeoisie, um, and it touches on the academia um, pathway of how the the negro race was able to elevate themselves but in the elevation 
they had to really abandon sort of all aspects of the Negro masses, be it if they went to an institution that was purely a, a puritanical um, culture, or if they had to uh, adjust and be more big business focused, capitalist focused, um, with um, with with how uh, Sabi put it, that knowing the right people, being in the right spaces, that's the crooks of how a lot of these uh, societies work, Greek organizations work. I mean, me being a part of one myself, I, I've seen firsthand that's how that works. Our connections are vital to our existence as the Black bourgeoisie, but it's never expanded out to the to the masses um, because that would then go against the status quo that the bourgeois and the Black bourgeois protect. And that's through academ academia and our higher uh, professional um, uh, pathways of work. Yeah, and another thing too, like some people will use the excuse and they'll say, well, Kamala Harris went to Howard University, right? And they'll say that's a black school. Mm -hmm. Yes, but Howard University is also, it's HBCU, it's a private school. And even at Howard University, again, a lot of those people end up being a part of like the black boule. So you look at some of the, the famous people and prominent politicians that went to Howard or Morehouse or Spelman. So it's not even necessarily that you have to go to a PWI, a, you know, a predominantly white institution. This exists at black institutions as well. Yeah. And, and I just want to share this because one of the things that uh, I caught, caught my eye about a day ago was I didn't know this. And this came out in 2022. So this is not even new news. But when I found this, I was just like, what? And this this shared, this is, the, the, the person who it, this is is actually sharing this now. That's why I was able to see this. But this is Isaiah, I'm sorry, Isaac Barnes. And this actually came out. He says, dreams come true. He says, 39-year-old Black entrepreneur makes history awarded $13.4 billion defense contract. Says meet Isaac, I'm sorry, meet Isaac Barnes, the young founder and president of Eminent Future, whose black-owned tech firm has been awarded a 13.4 billion dollar defense contract with the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Space Force. Isaac is a marvel, reminiscent of young black leaders transcending generations of relevant and personable individuals who have made such an extraordinary mark in history. Um. I want to ask both of you, and I'm going to start off with Sabi for this one. Is this truly a victory or is it, okay, who, who is this a victory for? Is this a victory for us as Black people or is this a victory for the empire? It's a victory for the empire and the military industrial complex. Uh, but of course, this article, they're trying to pass it off as though it's a victory for black people. And they see it as though like, we should be happy, you know, this happened for this young black man, not realizing like what this actually means. I mean, it's, it's defense, right? Mm -hmm. Kim, your thoughts? Yeah, I definitely think this is a win for him and his uh, immediate circle. Um, it's, it's, I've, I've never believed that black capitalism, at least post um, my, political awakening. I, I never believed that Black capitalism was a uh, an avenue for Black liberation. And the fact that he is not only participating in, um, in his own capitalism and it's being sold to us as something that's a win for us, his capitalism is in service of empire. Um, and that's, it's sort of like a, it's a double-edged sword there. Um, yeah. Yep course. So one of the things that I wanted to bring attention to, I, I saw that a, a, a replete, uh, sorry, a reply to this. Uh, this person says the diaspora become the new colonizers, blood money. And it's like, even though <laughs> this guy is seeming, seems is either white or white passing, he's kind of out of pocket, but he's right. Like, I'm sorry, but 
like if you're saying if you're trying to say well this is a victory for us i'm like no bro this is not a victory to any of us because your what you are creating will now be used against your own people and bombing black and brown people within western asia and then throughout the entire you know whole of africa and the problem is now is that defense is is deeply entrenched in corporate america and a lot of people you may not even realize that a company that you work for also has defense contracts like one of the things um for the pro palestinian protest one of the reasons why the students actually staged a walkout at Boston University and some of these other universities a couple of months ago is because they did their research and they found out a lot of these universities also have defense contracts uh, that are making these bombs to bomb people in Gaza. Like it's, it's so deeply entrenched. It's like, if you look at the company Honeywell, which makes those little space eaters that some of us use sometimes, Honeywell yeah. also is a part of defense. Like it's, that's why I continue to say there's no ethical consumption under capitalism because you may not directly work for a defense contractor or you may not, you know, directly, uh, I guess you may not think you directly benefit from a defense contractor, but we all do because it's just so deeply embedded in our society, at least in this country. I can't necessarily speak for other countries, but there's a lot of, of, of businesses that have defense contracts, uh, even YouTube. And I talked about this before, even YouTube donates to the military industrial complex. Google donates to the military industrial complex. That's what I'm saying. There's no ethical consumption under capitalism. So until you get rid of capitalism, we're always going to have this issue. And yeah. the, the, the defense contract, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was going to, I was going to say the defense contractors also have that connection to academia as well with the uh, college. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm a, I'm an alum of Florida a and university and I, um, another HBCU, and I was a part of their engineering school. And the big names that would always show up would be Northrop Grumman, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Honeywell, Caterpillar. Um, there was a lot of them see us as a as a recruiting ground that also helped feed into the um, the diversity building. Like they they would like to come to these black schools to get more of the aspiring black bourgeois into these uh, defense companies. And, and it's been working, and unfortunately. Same thing with Boeing. Like if you live in certain parts of South Carolina, Boeing is the only employer in town. And that's another thing. So it's like, what do you do if you can't go work for these people? Like, where, how are you supposed to get a job? And so this is another thing I think a lot of people just may not understand is that the military industrial complex is deeply embedded in this country. And for some people, depending on where you live, that's the only game in town. Just the same thing with Amazon. Whereas Amazon warehouses have kind of just taken over. You go to some of rural parts uh, in this country, particularly some of the smaller towns where all of the other small businesses have basically been wiped out because the Amazon warehouse was built. And now it's like, not everybody necessarily wants to go work for Amazon, but they're the only people there now. So what do you do? Yep. And just as an aside, uh, not only are all of us in whatever we partake in uh, also, you know, close, you know, indirectly connected to the military industrial complex, but we're also all closely connected to slavery in some way. I actually did a video about it, how slavery touches your life today. And I think a lot of people don't realize that now, I think that's really important because slavery, in, including slavery that still exists down to this day, touches our lives on a daily basis. So that's also really important. Um, Same thing for cell phones, by the way. Same thing for cell phones. This is why I say there's no ethical consumption under capitalism. Because yep. this is the thing. Is everybody supposed to get rid of their phones? <laughs> no. They make it so that you it's almost impossible to want to end it because our lives will somehow be more inconvenienced by it. 